Hi, everybody. We're on part six of Blind Dates. Wednesday, December 23rd. Blind date number four, Sarah's pick. My head is foggy when I wake up. Bits and pieces of a very realistic feeling dream linger, and it takes me a few minutes to separate fact from fiction. In it, all of these guys had shown up at Nana's, ready to pick me up for a date. It was like a zombie apocalypse, except the guys weren't dead. I shudder and throw off the covers, hoping a shower will chase the nightmare away. Walking down the stairs, I hear the noise coming from the kitchen. But I don't feel the usual fingers of dread that would normally start crawling and clawing their way through me. Instead, I find myself wondering if my cousin, Franny, managed to convince Aunt Kelsey to let her watch... The nightmare before Christmas, she couldn't stop talking about it at at breakfast yesterday. And do Olivia and Charlie know what's going on with Wes and Laurel? Yeah, I really want to know the answer to that one. Judd is the first person I see when I enter the kitchen. What's up, Soph? What's up, Sophie? He yells from where he's sitting with Charlie at one of the extra tables. Other members of my family mill around the kitchen and living room with coffee mugs and breakfast plates. Judd's still wearing his sweater from last night, but it looks like someone ate all the candy, leaving behind the wrappers that are still flying out of the the reindeer's butt. I walk over and point to his chest. Looks like you got robbed. He glances down, then throws his head back in a laugh, loud enough to get the attention of my very loud family. Nah, just got a little hungry in the middle of the night. There's literally no food at Charlie's house. Charlie thumps him on the shoulder. Dude, we have food. Nana has set the breakfast buffet style, so I grab a plate and wait in line for my trip down the counter. Whiffs of bacon, cinnamon, and coffee have my mouth watering. Aunt Kelsey's four daughters are sitting in chairs against the wall, and all of their faces are covered in icing. Hey, Fran. I call out. How was the movie? Fran's eyes get big. She leans forward in her chair and says in a serious voice, It was so scary. Her R's sound like W's. And it's honestly the cutest thing I've ever heard. Wait, hold on, let me do that line again. She leans forward in her chair and says in a serious voice, It was so scary. It was so scary. Her R's sound like, dub- sound like W's, and it's honestly the cutest thing I've ever heard. Just as I'm about to fill my plate, I see Sarah creep in the back door and start writing on the board. Everyone in the room gets silent, even the babies, as if they've been waiting all morning for this very minute. They probably have. Sarah finishes and spins around to face us. I'm so winning this. I'm so winning this, she says. Underground Underground Christmas, 8 o'clock p.m., formal attire, parentheses, I'll totally go shopping with you.
There's no way you got her a date to on... There's no way you got her a date to underground Christmas, Uncle Michael says. Hell, I've been trying to get tickets to that since I got... Since I got to town. What is underground Christmas? Aunt Patrice asks. I'm somewhat relieved that Aunt Patrice has never heard of it. But all I can think about right now is formal attire. Tell everyone what underground Christmas is. Tell everyone what underground Christmas is, Sarah, Nana says. Today, she's sporting an apron that has a picture of a spatula, whisk, spoon, and rolling pin with the words, Choose Your Weapon, written below them. Sarah rubs her hands together, clearly loving the attention. Well, underground Christmas is just the biggest, baddest party this town has ever seen. The Regional Arts Council puts it on, and it only happens every other year because they're so... Because there's so so much planning involved. My friend's parents' restaurant is just one of the local restaurants catering it. And so it's going to blow your mind. That's a pretty we- that's a pretty wild party, Sarah. How old is her date? Are you sure that's the right event for your hold on. Let me do that again. That's a pretty wild party, Sarah. How old is he? How old is her date? Are you sure that's the right event for your cousin? Uncle Charles gives his daughter a serious look. Her hands go to her hips. Dad, she's almost 18. Aunt Patrice set her up with a freshman, and so did I. A freshman in college. My eyebrows shoot up. Wild party? And my date is a college guy? Everyone starts talking at once. I drop down next to Charl- Charlie, Judd, and Olivia. Dude, Sarah's got you beat, Judd says. Charlie hits him in the shoulder again. Judd, you were the date I set her up with, so you're ripping on yourself. Judd winks, and I can't help but smile. Olivia picks up her plate and heads to the sink. Sophie, Sophie, what are you going to wear? When we were younger, the two of us used to play and not used to play. Let me take a sip of coffee. Used to play. In Aunt Camille's closet, which was filled with hats and party dresses and gloves and heels and everything else you you could imagine. We would dress up and Aunt Camille would serve us tea and cookies. I enjoyed it, but not as much as Olivia. No clue, I reply. I'm just bummed I can't go to, she says. And then it dawns on me. No backup on this date. So no one in the family will be on this date today? I ask. No one speaks up. Then I drop my head on the table. Sarah passes by, her hand running through my long through my long hair. Don't worry, Self. You'll date your date is super hot. You're going to have a blast. Super hot date, who just happens to be available for one of the hottest parties of the... Super hot date, who just happens to be available for one of the hottest parties of the year. Charlie snickers. He sounds like a winner. Sarah grins. Just wait. You'll see.
I call Addie the second the house clears from breakfast. She sounds as excited to dress me up as Olivia Olivia did. I have the perfect dress. Gabby wore this gorgeous gown to Cotillion last year, and I just know it will fit you. And if not, Marin will have something you can wear. She's always going to parties with her, with her sororities. Marin is one of, uh, Addie is one of three sisters, so there's never a shortage of clothes at her house. Okay, I may drive over if I can catch a break from work. We talk a few more minutes. I'm dying to ask about Griffin, but I don't. I promise to call her later, then I jump in the shower. When I get out, Margo is blowing up my phone. Margo, underground Christmas! Margo, I'm not sure you're prepared for this party. Margo, there will be naked people there. Lots of skin and nakedness. I barely get my hand dry enough to text her back. Me. What do you mean, naked people? Three question marks. Margo. Naked, as in little or no clothes. Brad and I went to one of those parties a few years ago, and I thought Brad's eyes were going to pop out of his head. And the naked people usually have food on them. That you're supposed to eat. Me. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Wait, hold on. Two, four, six, eight. Me. Sixteen question marks. (laughs) Me. What? Question mark. Um, me, what? Exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation, question mark, exclamation, question, exclamation, question, exclamation mark. Olivia knocks on the door, and I almost dropped my phone. Hurry up, she calls from the other side. Nana's letting us have the morning off to find you a dress. I clutch the towel tightly around me and swing the door open. Did you know there will be naked people at that party tonight with food on them? She lets out a giggle. I can't even right now. Just give me I can't even right now. Just give me a minute, I say and then shut the door. I dress quickly and dry my hair just enough so it won't be dripping on my back. Olivia is stretched out across the bed when I come out. Tell me about the naked people, I say. She looks over and looks at me. Oh, she rolls over and and looks at me. From what I've heard, there are guys and girls walking around in costume. Teeny tiny costumes that match whatever the theme is. And then... Some of them are draped across tables with food on them, like they're the platters. It's just, it's it's all to shock everyone there. For scandalous. Very scandalous. Oh, I'll be shocked, all right, I say. Moving on, Addie says her sisters have dresses I can borrow for tonight. She hops off the bed. Perfect! Let's grab Sarah and hit the road. Minutes later, we're in my car, headed back down I-20. To, um... To Minden. Olivia starts laughing at something on her phone. This picture Charlie posted is priceless! Sarah leans forward from the back seat. Y'all look so cute. Olivia holds the phone up where I can see it. And I, uh, 
almost swerve off the road. It's the one Charlie took last night when Wes and I were dancing, trying to empty the tissue box of ping pong balls. Except you really can't tell that's what we're doing. It just looks like Wes has has me dipped back, and we're both laughing hard. And so far, four people have tagged Griffin in the comments, Sarah says. Olivia laughs. Good! I want to beat my head against the steering wheel. I had another string of texts texts from him this morning. All saying the same thing. I made a mistake and please talk to me. I'm guessing this picture is what stirred him up. Griffin wants to get back together, I say. He keeps saying he made a mistake and he doesn't really want a break. Olivia twists in her seat and looks at me. Is that what you want? I stretch my neck. No, I stretch. Yeah, I stretch my neck to one side, then the other, trying to work out the tension I'm feeling. I just... Don't know if he really means what he says or if he's reacting to seeing me with other guys. Olivia chews on her bottom lip. Are you going to see him when we get to Minden? I shrug. I don't know. Part of me thinks, go ahead and get it over with. Have it out with him, one way or the other, but... (sighs) I'm not sure I can handle it yet. I can't quit thinking about how bummed he was when he heard that I wasn't going to Margot's. I mean, why would that have changed so quickly? Well, I think you have your answer, Olivia says. You have to finish the date, Sophie, Sarah adds. We ride in silence a few minutes, and then my phone starts beeping. Oh, God, is it Griffin again? I ask as Olivia checks my phone. She laughs. No, it's Seth. He wants to know if you can go to lunch tomorrow, since it's your free day. Before I can give her an answer, she unlocks my phone and runs her finger down my screen, scrolling through my conversations with my conversation with him. He's been texting you, but you're ignoring him. I'm not ignoring him. There's been a lot going on. I throw her a look. Also, ever heard of privacy? She rolls her eyes. You're ignoring him. Whatever. Tell him I'd love to go to lunch. I know that wouldn't have been my reply if Olivia hadn't made me feel bad about ghosting him, though. Olivia texts back and forth with him a few minutes, and then she laughs again. What's he saying? Well, Judd's texting you now. He's issued a challenge. (sighs) Reindeer pooing, reindeer pooing, sweater Judd? Sarah asks. Yep, same one, Olivia says. What's the challenge, I ask. He has a list of things he wants you to do while you're at underground Christmas, but you have to. To photograph proof. But you have to have photographic proof. He said it would be like a scavenger hunt. Judd is officially nuts. Let's hear the list. Olivia almost can't stop laughing along enough. 
uh, laughing long enough to read it. Okay, first, and I quote, a video of you eating a piece of food that was sitting at the naked, sitting on the naked skin of someone else. Bonus points if you were on the, bonus points if it was on the buttocks. His words, not mine. I lean my head back against the headrest. The fact that these things are even possible is freaking me out. Man, I wish I was going with you, Olivia says. Sarah lets out a sigh. Me too. You look stunning, Addie says, as I spin around in front of the mirror attached to the closet door. The dress is incredible. I don't know what kind of material it is, but it's soft and fits me like a second skin. The dress is long, skimming the floor, and the and the pewter color, pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R, pewter color has a little bit of shine to it, so it sparkles when the light hits it. But quit pulling at your top, Olivia says. The dress is, stu- is strapless. And I have the never-ending feeling that it's just two seconds from spilling down. It's not going anywhere. Addie hands me a pair of heels, and I slip them on. She came back with us to Nana's to help me get ready. I hadn't realized how much I missed her until she opened the door. There had been a half door there had been a half dozen dresses for me to choose from in her sister's closet, but the second I laid my eyes on this one, I knew it was the one. Are you sure Gabby won't mind if I borrow this? I ask. No, not at all. I hear the sound of a picture being taken and spin around. Olivia holds up her hand. Settle down. I'm just sending it to Margot. And then every other member of her family will have a copy of within 10 minutes. Well, at least this Well, at least this outfit doesn't blink, Olivia says. Okay, my bad. I may have accidentally posted it. The way she's smiling tells me it was no accident. Olivia! Olivia! I grab her phone. The photo shows the dress from the back, which is almost as pretty as the front. We decided to leave my hair down, and Olivia curled it into loose waves. In the picture, my face is turned to the side, and I'm looking across the mirror, and I'm looking at the mirror so you can only see my profile. The light from the window is pouring in, making the dress really shine. See how beautiful you look. See how beautiful you look, she says. I can't help but smile. Then I see the caption. Cinderella getting ready for her big night out and groan. Really, Liv? Cinderella? Does that make y'all the mean stepsisters? Only if that means we get to go to the ball, too, Addie says. And then the comments start coming in. Most of them are about how pretty I look. But I notice Griffin has been tagged twice already. I groan again. When my phone starts dinging, I'm not surprised. I swipe it open and see his latest text. Griffin, I don't know what's going on, but I have to talk to you. I have to see you. My finger hovers over the keyboard, but I have no idea what to say to him. Would he be texting me like this if I was sitting at home crying over him? That's the part I can't get past. 
So instead of texting him back, I throw the phone in this in the small chair beyond uh, by the window. I bet Nana has a necklace or bracelet that would go perfect with that dress, Olivia says, then heads to the door. Addie bounds off the bed, following her out. Oh, I want to come see. For the first time all day, I'm alone. I glance at the phone and realize I haven't heard from Margo since this morning. I sit down in the chair and pull it and pull up our conversation. Me, what's up? You've been ridiculously quiet today. She doesn't respond immediately, which worries me. Leaning back in the chair, careful not to mess up my hair, I stare at the phone until a constant thumping from outside gets my attention. I peek through the blinds and look down over the driveway that runs in between Nana's house and Wes's. And there he is, dribbling a basketball. He looks like he's been at it for a while because his shirt is off and his hair looks damp with sweat. Wes bounces the ball a few times, then shoots. It swishes through the air. Uh, It swishes through the net. Rinse, repeat. He's got a pretty good average going. Only missing one of every four or five shots. Every time he shoots, I can't help but stare at the muscles in his back. What is happening to me? I'm just now feeling like I'm part of the five... I'm just now feeling like I'm part of the Fab Four again. I can't screw it up by thinking about Wes like that. Our group went down that road before, and it ended disastrously. Olivia and I both decided at the beginning of freshman year that we had a crush on Wes. But since she swore hers was stronger, I backed off. They tried to date for a few weeks, but it just didn't work. Then they didn't speak to each other for months, which was horrible for all of us. Charlie brought it up. Charlie brought us all together, told them, and told them to get over it. So we all agreed that our friendship was too important to risk it. And we decided that we would all only be friends. And that's all we've ever been since. But the thoughts floating through my head while I watch him are, are not the way you think about a friend. Seriously, when did he get all those muscles? Sarah pops in the room and lets out a squeal. Sophie, you look perfect. I almost fall out of the chair. I close the blinds so she won't know I've been practically drooling over a half-naked and sweaty Wes. Grabbing the small head, uh, beaded bat, uh, wait, what? Okay. Grabbing the small beaded bag, I check my phone once more to see if Margot has texted me back before dropping it inside. Thanks, Sarah. I'm trying to be freaked, trying not to be freaked. Out about this party or the college guy you set me up with she's so excited she practice she's practically shaking well he's here are you ready i want to sink down on the bed i'm not sure i've ever been so nervous for a date especially since i have especially since i have judd's list scrolling through my brain Then Olivia and Addie are back, armed with necklaces, bracelets, and earrings. 
Once they think I'm finally dressed and ready, Addie says, Okay, let's go check this guy out. The house is packed, like I knew it would be today. Everyone wants to be a part of this date thing. I don't know that the guy, I don't know where, I don't know the guy I'm going out with. But I feel sorry for him already. I can't imagine what it's like to pick up a girl for a date and have 20 people staring at you. At the top of the stairs, I take a deep breath. The foyer is crowded. But I didn't expect to see the... The bedding sheet taped to the wall next to an old family portrait. Graham's standing Graham's standing next to it, holding a couple of pens, and he's acting like the guy at the fair, t- trying to entice anyone to anyone who passes by to stop and play. How embarrassing. I get to the bottom of the stairs and a guy in a tux takes a couple of steps toward me. Pleasantly surprised, doesn't even cover it. Sarah was right, he's hot. Hey, I'm Paolo. Reese. Paolo Reese. He's holding a hand out to me and I take it. He's tall, with big brown eyes, and his black hair has a slight wave to it, just enough to give it a little body. You look gorgeous. Okay, Sarah won. And from the looks of Charlie and Judd, and from the looks Charlie and Judd are throwing from across the room, they know it too. Thank you. You look really nice too. Sarah is beaming, and so are Olivia and Addie. Of course, Olivia is capturing all of this with her camera, so I better prepare myself for the posts to come. Paolo turns toward Papa and shakes his hand. I won't have her out too late. Papa shakes his head back, uh, shakes his hand back, and then leans forward to kiss me on the forehead. You look just like your mother did at your age. Have fun, sweet girl. I'm not going to cry. I'm totally not. A couple of my uncles walk over to Graham and start arguing over one of the boxes. I guess after getting a good look at Paolo, they want to change their bet. Can't give you that one, Graham says. Aunt Kelsey already claimed it. I try to ignore their... Ignore their ridiculousness. With my hand still in his, Paolo pulls me through the foyer and out the front door. We're headed down the brick path to where his car is parked on the street. When I look toward Wes's house, he's still in the driveway. And a sh- with his shirt off. But he's holding the ball against his hip, watching us. His eyes catch mine, and he gives me a small nod. I nod back and then slide into Paolo's car, where he's holding the driver's door, uh, the door open for me. So that's probably... So, that's probably the most nervous I've ever been picking up a girl in my life. Paulo says, once he's in the car, Seriously? It didn't show, I say. If that was him nervous, I can't imagine what his confidence must look like. He looks at me just before he cranks the car. There were so many people. There were just so many people. I laugh. Welcome to my world. We pull away from my par- my grandparents' house. 
I refuse to look back to see if Wes is still watching. Instead, I turn toward Paolo. Okay, I'm just going to ask, why on earth did you not already have a date to this party? I mean, is there something I should know? He laughs. Straightforward. I like it. I don't think he's going to say anything else, but then he clears his throat. There's this girl. He starts. There's all, there always is, I say, and he laughs again. I moved here halfway through high school, but I didn't meet her until we were at LSU. Even though she's from here, things are complicated. I thought that maybe when we were both back on break, some of the issues we're having might work themselves out, but uh, it's not looking too good. I'm sorry, I say. I want to add, I'm sure it will work out, but it sounds so lame. And I'm certainly not in any place to give anyone relationship advice. I stare out the front window, and Paolo glances at me once, then twice. So what's this Sarah was telling me all about the blind dates? I say, it's complicated, and he laughs again. I overheard I overheard my boyfriend telling his friend that he wanted a break from me because senior year is supposed to be fun. Ouch. What a dick. Yeah, so this was Nana's idea of cheering me up. Paolo slows at a red light and turns toward me. Is it working? I cock my head to the side. It's been different. And I've had some really weird and some really fun dates. My ex keeps texting pics of me dating on social media. And since I'm not curled in a ball, bawling my eyes out, he's begging to see me, to talk to me. So I guess it's working. The light is red and... The light is still red, and Paolo leans a little closer. Then this is what we're going... Then this is what we're going to do. We're going to flood his timeline with pictures of us having fun tonight. A car behind him honks as the light turns green. And Paolo returns his attention ahead. I'm glad he misses the ridiculous smile stretching across my face. Okay, but I don't want to do anything that makes things more complicated for you. Don't worry about me, the balls in her court. She knows I'm ready when she is. She was glad when I didn't have to go to this thing alone. She was glad... She, um, no, I'm just glad I didn't have to go to this thing alone. I've decided whoever this girl is, she's a dummy. He's cute and nice and genuine, and she's an idiot. So where did you move here from? Gabo, Gabo Frio, which is a small town near Rio in Brazil. Oh, wow, do you like it here? He shrugs. There's things I like and things I miss back home. I turn sideways in my seat so I can see so I can see him better. Out of all of the places your parents could pick, why Shreveport, Louisiana? It's the same thing I've wondered about my grandfather. Paula laughs. We had some family who moved here a few years before us. One of my cousins got accepted to physical therapy school at University Health. My parents keep hearing about how nice 
my my parents kept hearing about how nice life was here. <clears throat> so we moved. They opened a restaurant similar to the one they had back home, and it's done well. Mom gets involved with this Christmas party when we first got got involved with this Christmas party when we first got here as a way to get to know people and she's now on the board or something like that my phone beeps and I scramble in my purse to pull it out sorry I'm expecting a message from my sister she's a few weeks away from giving from having her first baby and she's on bed rest is she okay he asks I think so I mutter as I open her tech, her message. Margo, Olivia sent me a pic of you. <coughs> Olivia sent me a pic of you. You look so beautiful. Me, are you okay? Haven't heard from you all day. Margo, I'm fine. Had to go back to the doctor. But I'm home now, just tired. Send me some pics tonight and have fun. Me. I will. I'm just about to put my phone in, away in my bag when it dings once more. But it's not a message from Margo. Judd, don't forget about the challenges. I roll my eyes and slip my phone back in my bag. Turning to Paulo, I say, So, there is this one other thing you can help me out with. Paulo told me the theme to this year's party was Feel the Beat. So I'm expecting something music related, but I'm not expecting the group of singing Elvises that are on the curb next to the valet stand. We're barely out of Paulo's car before it's whisked away. There's a desk. <clears throat> There's a desk to one side with a woman dressed like Madonna from her early years. From her early year, years. She squeals when she sees Paolo. You made it! And, she, then, and then she looks at me and squeals again. Sarah said you were... Sarah said you were adorable and she was right! Paolo turns toward me. Sophie... This is my mom, Briar. But you can call me Madonna tonight. She slaps <coughs> some wristbands on us and hugs Paolo across the table. Y'all have fun. We walk past the Elvises who are belting out <coughs> Hound Dog and stop in front of a small, very small, building next to a large group of people. It's not really even a building. It's more like a box with a set of double doors on the front. And we're all just standing in front of it. What is this? Paula laughs, the elevator. I look around, but there's nothing else. Where does the elevator go? Paolo squeezes my hand. You'll see. When it opens... There's a man inside who's a dead ringer with the lead singer of Aerosmith. He holds the doors open and says, Going down? I giggle. And we load as many people inside as possible. Oh. As soon as the door shut, the Elvises... No, this. as soon as the door shut, Steven Tyler lookalike starts belting out love in an elevator. He sounds just like the original. This is wild, I stage whispered Apollo. We haven't even gotten inside yet. We haven't even gotten inside yet. The elevator doors open up. 
coffee break. Hold on. Oh, that's good. All right. Scoot, and we scoot in close to Paulo. We, we, the elevator doors open up and I scoot in close to Paulo. Afraid of getting swept away with the crowd. It's packed. But the ceilings are so high and the space is so big that it's not claustrophobic. It was a building that stood here years ago, but it got torn down. Paolo tells me this space was the basement someone refreshed about 10 years ago. There's so much going on here. There's so much going on at once that I almost can't take in what I'm seeing. The space is divided in sections, like big rooms. Each section has a musical theme. Let's check Let's check them out, Paolo says, and pulls me along. I think there are as many people working the different areas as there are guests. There's a 50s area. There's a 50s area complete with girls in poodle skirts dancing with guys in leather jackets. A hall with enormous masks of the painted faces from Kiss. A room that's purple from top to bottom with a prince look-alike. Ha. Belting out little red Corvette. It goes on and on. By the time we get to the back of the space, we've gone through ten different staged areas. And, And roaming through each space... Our entertainers, a girl on stilts, acrobats, and even a man swallowing fire and then blowing it back out. But it's the main room that blows me away. It's basically a carnival. Everything blow glows in the dark. Neon light, like neon lights. And there are girls hanging from swings suspended in the air and guys jumping from pole to pole above us. I've never seen anything like it. I follow Paolo to a round dessert dessert table. A woman is lying across the top of it on her stomach wearing only a red thong and a tiny bikini top. She's acting as human as a human serving tray for miniature cupcakes. The cupcakes are sitting on her back, legs, and even her butt, her butt cheeks. She's got her chin resting in her hands, and she's turning to look at, and she's turned to look at Paolo and me. I reckon the red velvet ones, they're sinfully delicious, she says, blowing us a kiss. Paolo laughs, then pushes me toward the table. Looks like we can check one of those chal- Looks like we can knock out one of those challenges. He holds up his phone. Well, wait. He holds his phone up while I take baby steps toward the table. People all around me are snatching cupcakes off of her and posing for pictures. It's just a cupcake. It's just a cupcake, I tell myself. And it's in one of those paper paper wrappers, so it's not actually touching your skin. As awkward as this is, I'm glad Judd issued the challenges, since it's giving us something to do. But of course, I'll never tell Judd that. I turn around to make sure that Paolo is getting this. He gives me a thumbs up. I quickly grab a chocolate cupcake from the small of her back. All the red velvet ones are on her butt, and I just couldn't bring myself to touch them. 
bonus points or not. I hold up the cupcake and smile at the camera and then shove it in my mouth. I may not want to do these challenges, but there's no way I'm losing. Judge said if I don't complete them, complete them all, I have to go on a second date with Hundred Hands Harold. Olivia, who was texting on my behalf, made Judd promise to um, streak down Nana's street wearing nothing more than a Santa hat and a smile if I finished his list. Truthfully, we're all losers in this challenge if I have to witness that. One down, nine to go, Paolo says, laughing. Seriously, seriously. The one I'm looking forward to is watching you spin around the pole. I think I saw one in the heavy metal, I think I saw one in the heavy metal room. I'm glad you're enjoying this, I say, as he drags me into another area. The girls on the um, table, the girls on the table, the girl on the table calls after us. You can come back for the seconds anytime. Before the night is over, I complete all the challenges, including participating in a a limbo competition, singing on stage with the backup singers in the Motown room, and swing dancing with one of the Elvises. We've all filled my ent- we've all f- we've blah, 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 blah. we've also filled my timeline with a ton of pics. I have twelve unread messages from Griffin. We drop down on a bench on a street on street level, waiting for the valet to bring Paolo's car back. It's blissfully quiet up here compared to the party downstairs. Paolo nudges me with his shoulder. That was more fun than I thought it would be. Hundred Hands Harold must have been a pretty bad date. If you don't want to re- if you don't want to repeat, I nudged him back. You have no idea. I can't believe I agreed to do all of that. It's so unlike me. I think it's awesome. And maybe your ex was the one holding you back, keeping that fun side locked down. I was worried when my little sister's friend said that she wanted to set up, uh, set me up on a date. But this was great. My phone dings again, and both of us look at the screen. Message 13 from Griffin. And mission, accom- and mission accomplished. Paolo says, I nod, then look at him. None of this is going to mess things up with the girls you li- with the girl you like, is it? I really don't want her to get upset if she sees pictures with us together. No, she was here tonight, actually. We talked while you and the Supremes were singing Stop in the name of love. He laughs again. I explained what was going on, and I think I actually got some brownie points from her with helping you out. Good. I'm glad I can help, I say, and I mean it. Paolo is a really cool guy. I just hope the girl comes to her senses and snaps him up. By the time Paolo drops me at the at Nana's, I'm exhausted, and my feet are killing me. What I'm not expecting is for Charlie, Wes, and Judd to jump off the porch and break out in a rendition of the song I sang with the Supremes cover band. Please don't tell me I sounded that bad, I say when they're done. 
Charlie checks his watch and pulls out a piece of paper from his back pocket, then lets out a groan. Ugh, Uncle Ronnie won the bet tonight. Tonight. He starts texting. You were awesome, Judd says, especially when you rolled that bull side, side saddle. I mean, awesome. Glad I can entertain you, I say. Truthfully, the challenge is made by night. Not sure why you're, you're excited, Judd. This means... Not sure, not sure why you're excited, Judd. This means that you lost, Wes says. Seeing me run naked down the street is a win for everyone, he says. Just make sure we have plenty of notice so I can make sure that I'm... Just make sure we have plenty of notice so I can make sure I'm not here. Charlie answers. Me too, says Wes. I raise a hand. Me three. Charlie and Judd wander wander back inside the house, arguing over the logistics of the run. Yeah, Charlie and Judd. But Wes drops down on the front steps, and I sit next to him. His shoulder nearly touches mine. I stretch my legs out and kick off my shoes. God, that feels good. You look really pretty, Wes says, nudging his shoulder against mine. Thanks, I say, nudging him back. Wes rests his elbow on the step behind me. So, if you had to, rank your date so far, best to worst. I twist around until I'm curled up on the step facing him. Clearly, Harold was the worst. And not just him, but the whole date. I mean, any date where goats are eating my clothes has gone downhill. Wes laughs while I continue. For first place... Hmm. Uh, I had a lot of fun on the first one with Seth. And tonight was a blast, too. Wes has a fake, outraged look on his face. You mean the date that Judd... You mean... You mean the date with Judd... Isn't running... You mean the date with Judd isn't running in the first? I'm shocked. Yeah, shock. I know. So which date is the best kisser? My money's on a hundred hands. I duck my head so he doesn't see the blush. He leans forward and lowers his head, trying to catch my gaze. Don't tell me you've had all these dates but no good night kiss. I straighten, and then he's so close. I push his shoulder playfully, but my hand lingers there. Before I can pull it away, his hand covers mine. We're both surprised, but neither of us moves. His eyes go to my lips, and he squeezes my hand. I catch myself leaning closer to him. Warning bells blare through my blank brain, but I can't stop. The sound of the door opening behind us is what does it. I push back, nearly falling off the step I'm sitting on. We both look shocked at what almost happened. I glance to the door and see Nana almost in trance, almost uh, alarm etched on her face. I jump up. I I can feel Wes behind me. It's not what it... I begin, but Nana interrupts me, her face softening. I just got off the phone with your mother. They've admitted Margot to the hospital. 
The contractions haven't stopped, and her swelling is getting worse. My stomach drops, and it takes a few moments for me to process what she said. Is she okay? Is the baby okay? This is too soon. She's not supposed to have the baby for another six weeks. Nana wraps me in her arms. It's not the best situation, but she's okay. The baby's okay. She doesn't say it, but I feel like she's left off the words for now.